Hello, my friend. I am thrilled to be with you here today. Thanks for, so much for joining me on the podcast. I am so excited to introduce to you Carolyn Moyers. Dr. Moyers is an OBGYN in Fort Worth, Texas, and sh we are going to get into all things HRT. This is your 2024 HRT update with Dr. Carolyn Moyers. Dr. Moyers, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. This is one of my favorite topics. Awesome. Tell, tell everyone a little bit about yourself before we get started. Yeah. Yeah, I am a board certified OBGYN. I'm menopause certified by the Menopause Society and I'm an ISHWISH fellow. So the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health has a fellow status, which, you know, if if anybody who's been trained in the OBGYN world knows that we didn't get a ton of education in menopause and sex med. And this is why in this vacuum of knowledge that a lot of women are landing in these hormone replacement therapy clinics getting inadequate in suboptimal or just dangerous care. And yeah. so I opened in the height of the pandemic, I opened a practice because I just believed that I deserved better. I was working 24 hour shifts as a hospitalist and sometimes every other day. And I was just really believing that I deserve better and from the healthcare system as well as my patients. And it was a dream that I had kind of percolating for several years, but was entirely terrified to take the leap of faith. And so I finally did it. I bartered for office space. I didn't have any shifts on Mondays and Fridays. And so I just started. And I really thought that osteopathic medicine, you know, or the osteopathic technique that I have, because I also have a fellowship in osteopathic medicine, was going to be my secret sauce because of you know, uh, the hundred of OBGYNs or more that are in the Fort Worth community, no one held this skill set. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would market to my OBGYN colleagues and they would send their OB patients to me because I was doing no primary OB to do the osteopathic treatment for back pain and pelvic pain and pregnancy and postpartum. But what I found having a gynecology and osteopathy practice is that women really wanted time and space to be heard in the healthcare system. When they were done having babies, they didn't want to, have to take a half day off to go see their OBGYN and wait around to maybe get seen and maybe be rescheduled. And they were just tired of suffering. And so it's just kind of developed that it's forced me to beef up my knowledge in menopause and, and perimenopause and sexual medicine. And it is the joy of my life. Like, this is so exciting. I love taking care of women. I spent a decade delivering babies. And now it's it's time for a new chapter. Oh, I love that. And I love how you just saw the need and said, I can, I can do this. I can take care of these women. So, oh, I've got chills. Thank you. Well, it's HRT update today. And yeah. so let's talk with a short definition of perimenopause and menopause. Yes, I have these conversations often, even with other physician mom friends. And we kind of go back and forth. Like I had one conversation all day long. I felt like it went back and forth uh, via text trying to understand this. So if you're feeling confused by this, you're not alone, okay? Because even educated women who went through the healthcare system, they, you know, they think that they should know and they still don't understand. So it is rather confusing. Menopause, let's just start there, is defined as being 12 months without a cycle for no other cause. The average age of menopause is 51. Typically, women 45 to 55 are going through menopause. So perimenopause are the years around menopause, the years leading up to menopause. And it has a myriad of symptoms. You know, we think commonly of hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, maybe just some disturbed sleep, but there's also mood disturbance and increased instances of depression, agitation, decreased sexual desire, skin crawling sensations, dizziness, heart palpitations, like it affects us from head to toe. And what often happens is that you find women going to their PCP and maybe they're to a cardiologist, maybe they're thinking about seeing a neurologist, who knows? And they are told, you're fine, your labs are fine, everything looks good. But the woman says, well, but I don't feel fine. Like, how is it true that everything looks fine, but I am, don't feel at home in my body anymore? And so knowing that perimenopause can present in your late 30s and early 40s is really important. And just because you've had that final menstrual period does not mean that you now your symptoms are over, right? I'm wow. not going to have any hot flashes or night. I just today saw a woman in her early 70s who said, I have tried time and again over the last 20 years to come off of hormone therapy because I generally take good care of myself. I exercise, I eat well. 
I feel great. But when I come off of a hormone therapy, even if it's just because I've missed a couple of pills because I was on vacation, I immediately have severe hot flashes, night sweats, dizziness, heart palpitations. So just because you've gone through menopause does not mean that the symptoms resolve. Some women, even in their 80s, will report still having symptoms without hormone therapy. So Having said that, it's also important for you to know, because a lot of people say, well, how do I know if I'm menopausal? I had a hysterectomy. I've had an endometrial ablation. I have a progesterone producing IUD and I don't have a cycle. My favorite thing on earth. And (laughs) so good. So in that instance, if you're starting to have this collection of symptoms, you know, you could do blood work, but is it necessary? Not always. Typically, when we're when we're starting to have these perimenopausal symptoms and patients come in and say, oh, my hormones are off, you know, a lot of times what happens is that doctors roll their eyes or they feel frustrated because a lot of times they know or they or they ha- they either have a lack of knowledge or they know that the hormones typically are not going to help them. OK, so mm-hmm. when we're doing a testing or lab draws in that perimenopausal phase, we're really looking for any other causes. Right. Because. Maybe there's some insulin resistance. Maybe there's a thyroid disorder that's presented. Maybe we're anemic. Maybe we have a vitamin D deficiency. Maybe there are other reasons for the call. So when we've ruled out other reasons, but we still have this collection of symptoms that really didn't fit into any other category, you're like, yep, this is perimenopause. It's very classic, right? And so, but in, I'm sorry, I need to go back to the the menopausal issue and not having a cycle. How do you know that it's menopause? An FSH level two occasions that's elevated six weeks apart. That's how it would confirm, like, yes, indeed, this is menopause. Now, in perimenopause, a lot of times your your hormone levels look perfectly normal. I often say, like, we don't usually catch them misbehaving <laughs> until we're into menopause. Because what happens in that perimenopausal phase is that the ovaries are not responding. We have that FSH stimulation being sent from the brain and it's signaling to the ovaries, hey, give me some estrogen. And our levels are all over the place. So it's more like a roller coaster. Um, and that's why women se- seem to feel so erratic and not at home and kind of rageful. Uh-huh. And why it's hard to hard to pin down, right? If it's yeah. changing. Yeah. yeah. And also the experience for peri- perimenopause can be highly variable, right? Like I remember I was like, oh, I'm gaining weight and my skin got really dry. Mm-hmm. What is, but my periods are perfectly regular. What is going on? Yeah. And that's a symptom that I didn't even mention, but irregular periods are oftentimes, you know, one of those first telltale signs that things are going off the rail is that periods start to change. They might be longer. They might be more frequent. They might be heavier. They might be shorter. You might skip months. So definitely something to investigate. If you start having irregular periods, track your cycles, get in to see your gynecologist. Yes. So periods are definitely one. And and you're right. Perimenopause is nonconformist. It does not fit a particular picture. There is, you know, there's so many symptoms that can be involved in it and everybody's experience is going to be unique. Okay. That helps, right? Because sometimes you're like, my friend doesn't have the same thing I have. I didn't get the same blood work my friend got. This is individualized to you. Yes. Yeah. It's very specifically tailored. Great. Great. All right. So let's get into the HRT. You know, what is hormone replacement therapy? So hormone replacement therapy is essentially replacing those hormones that your ovaries once produced for you. You know, our ovaries produce estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And so hormone replacement therapy, when we typically think about it in a broad spectrum, you know, we have a couple of buckets, right? We have our estrogen replacement, our progesterone replacement, and sometimes our testosterone replacement. And if now estrogen is the big one that everybody's out, everybody's worried it's going to cause breast cancer. Those myths have been debunked, ladies. I'm so sorry. The way the Women's Health Initiative was put out to the world was very misleading. And it has done, you know, two decades of disservice to physicians who are, which has led to a lot of misinformation and a lot of vacuums of, of good information. And then people take to social media and we have hormone replacement therapies on every corner that's injecting women with testosterone or pellets. And it is, it's quite frankly, dangerous and harmful. However, we, we know that estrogen does not cause breast cancer. Actually, the incidence of breast cancer in those who took estrogen alone was less in the Women's Health Initiative. But what got publicized was that hormones cause breast cancer, right? Well, that was in the arm who took estrogen and progesterone. 
and it was not statistically significant. It was like eight more cases of breast cancer. I don't have that specific data in front of me, so forgive me. But, and, and it only looked at one formulation of estrogen and one formulation of progesterone. So it was it was some, somewhat limited. Like, yes, it gave us a lot of good data, but it was also somewhat limited because it only looked at those particular formulations. So having said that, we do not need to fear hormone replacement therapy unless we have significant contraindications to being on hormone replacement therapy. Most healthy individuals who are the average age of menopause, it's very safe for them to go on hormone therapy. They've had these hormones their entire life, right? Right, <laughs> right. And right. The, the risk of being pregnant, our hormone levels are significantly higher, right? The risk of being on a birth control pill, those levels are significantly higher. Hormone replacement ther- therapy typically is low dose therapy to alleviate those symptoms, right? Right. And it has indication, like if you look at the most recent Menopause Society, their update, their new position statement, I believe it came out in 2022, the indications for hormone therapy per the FDA, it's approved for moderate to severe hot vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes in our night sweats to serve sleep. Prevention of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, treatment of hypoestrogenism caused by hypogonadism, like if you've had your ovaries removed or you've had premature ovarian insufficiency, which makes me um, think that I need to tell you that early menopause is defined as 40 to 45 years of age. Premature ovarian insufficiency is when you go through menopause be for natural natural causes or surgical or chemotherapy or something of that nature before the age of 40. Okay. And that has its own set of healthcare risks and needs hormone replacement therapy at higher doses. Okay. So is is there a time that's too late to start? Yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, that we have a, the timing hypothesis in terms of when is optimal time to start hormone therapy, and that is within 10 years of menopause or before the age of 60. Now, that's not necessarily a hard, fast rule if you have a generally healthy individual or you have somebody who was on hormone replacement therapy for many years but maybe took a holiday and it's like, hey, you know, this is pretty miserable. I'm, I'm pretty mm-hmm. symptomatic. You, so you have to kind of take some of those things into consideration because if somebody went through menopause at the age of 55 and now they're 62 and wanting to go on hormone therapy and generally are healthy, am I going to say this is an absolute no? No, I'm going to counsel them on risk and benefits and what are our options here and discuss, you know, for them what is right for them. The thought is over the age of 60, we have inherent cardiovascular risk. We know that estrogen is a vasodilator. So when we see those increased incidence of blood clots or concerns of that nature, it's generally in the first couple of months after starting hormone therapy. But for the average individual who's, you know, 48, 52, starting hormone therapy, very minimal risk. Okay. So I I do get that question quite a bit, actually, because people say, well, it's been three years or four years. Is is it too late for me? No, absolutely not. And then the next question always is, well, how long do I need to... to stay on this hormone therapy, like it, it can't be good for me to be on this hormone therapy, can it? And then it's like, actually, hormone therapy remains the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms, for genitourinary syndrome of menopause, the vaginal dryness, burning, itching, frequency, urgency that we have. And, and it helps to prevent bone fractures and, and bone loss, right? We know there was a study that came out last month looking at um, hormone therapy use in individuals once they reached Medicare age, so 65 and older. And this was a really cool study because it looked at all the different prescriptions that were for these individuals. So we saw much more than just an oral estrogen and an oral progesterone, right? We saw the various um, combinations of medications that happen when you have that unique tailored hormone therapy. And of those individuals, when they looked at them versus those who discontinued or never used hormone therapy, it was all about, you know, quality of life, et cetera. When we compared those, we saw a decreased incidence of mortality of breast cancer, of colorectal cancer, of lung cancer, of congestive heart failure, of blood clots, of atrial fibrillation, so that irregular heartbeat, of heart attacks, and dementia. So 
is it safe to use it beyond the age of 65? The answer is yes. You know, it needs to be tailored. It's dependent on tight route doses. I typically say if your hormone therapy isn't working for you, it's either the dose, the route, or the formulation. So they are generally always edits that can be made. And a lot of times when patients come and have this counseling visit with me, they feel extremely overwhelmed because it's like, oh, you know, like they thought it was just like going to be like one option and they feel overwhelmed that there are so many options. And I say, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I want you to feel empowered. Like how exciting that I have so many different options so that I can find one that's tailored specifically to me, my lifestyle, my body, what works best. One of my favorite things to do is kind of is make the edits. I always say that your the magic happens in the follow up. OK, <laughs> if I'm, if a provider says that there's only one way to treat your hormones, or, you know, to replace your hormones run, if they say that, you know, here's your hormone therapy, I'll see you next year run because yeah. generally they just don't get it. Right. Or and, and if they try to give you a pellet, if they try to inject a pellet in your bottom, just run. <laughs> OK. So, so the, the follow-up, you know, it takes about eight to 12 weeks for us to see full effect of your current dosing. And this is when the magic gets to happen, right? So I've had, you know, 50% reduction in my hot flashes and night sweats. I'm still not sleeping well. You know, I, I, my hot flashes are gone, but I have these night sweats still, you know, and it, and it can be as simple as somebody's using Divigel, which is an estradiol gel that they apply to their thigh or lower abdomen daily, and typically, if they're dosing it in the morning, I have them dose it in the evening and their night sweats are gone. Nice. They're, they're very simple little edits that can happen. Yeah. So in terms of the dose route formulation, you were asking me about, you know, options for hormone therapy earlier. Before, before, I, before I let you go there, I do want to just yeah. stop and really sit on something that you said, because I get this, some of these questions I get a lot. So you're going to follow up in a couple of months. So this is a journey and it may seem slow. It is not, you know, take a Tylenol and your elbow feels better. You no. you take it, you have some time with it, you notice what's going on, what's better, what's not better. This is a journey, but this is how it is supposed to go. And yeah. so I just want, want to normalize that for people as well so they don't think yeah. I'm go in and next week I'm going to be all better. It's all going to be gone. Yes. Yeah. So don't expect, a, you know, that you're like your 25 year old self in two weeks time. No, we are replacing these hormones slowly, low and slow. So we start low and work our way up. We kind of titrate it to your relief of symptoms. And so what I typically tell my patients is it takes me about three to six months to get you feeling yourself again. My goal is that we're 80 to 100 percent better. <laughs> And I have seen dramatic transformations. You know, people are able to come off of certain medications that they were on, you know, to treat this collection of symptoms, right? When they were going to all of the doctor visits, trying to figure it out. You know, they've negotiated leave from their job that they hated and are starting a new life. You know, like so many are back at the gym. I've hired a trainer because they actually have energy for life anymore. Like that lack of drive for life, it's more than a lack of drive of sex. A lot of people are like, I just don't have the energy to get off the couch anymore. Right, right. Awesome. All right. So now let's talk about what are what's available for hormone replacement therapy. What what can you use or what can your doctor offer you? Yeah. So one of the, the big myths that I just want to start when, when we start talking about hormone replacement therapy is that bioidentical hormone is a marketing term. It's a brilliant marketing term. It's made a lot of people a lot of money. It sounds so natural. It sounds so natural. And what? With the lack of risk? No, no, it's still hormones. And I would say it's riskier when we're using compounded hormones, because what most individuals think about when they hear bioidentical is that they're getting some natural yams and it's and it's it's compounded hormones. We have FDA approved bioidentical hormones where we can safely with regulated medication. So I know you're getting a consistent dose and it's covered by your insurance. So there is no need to do bioidentical hormones unless we have some sort of odd allergy or reaction. Like we don't have to go down the road of compounded hormones to get good hormone therapy. I recently had a patient who moved from California and she was all worried about the cost because she was spending several hundred dollars on her compounded hormones. And I was like, friends, you are going to be so delighted. Those are approved medications that will be covered by your insurance. Um, it's phenomenal and it's the savings. So, yeah. so just to say that, that's a big misnomer that I need people to know. 
So when it comes to estrogen, we have oral estrogen, we have transdermal estrogen in the form of a patch or a gel. The patch is once weekly or twice weekly, and the gel is a daily application. And we have a vaginal ring. Now, most of the time when people think about the vaginal ring, they think about local intimate skin therapy, right? That local vaginal estrogen for the vaginal dryness. But we actually have a ring that has two dosings that are systemic, meaning whole body. It's going to get in your bloodstream and it's going to raise those estrogen levels to help with the hot flashes and the night sweats and those vasomotor symptoms, right? Okay. And so I was just thinking brain fog, brain fog. That's one of those symptoms that a lot of people are with all the men about that. Yeah. And replacing that estrogen oftentimes will help and sometimes even testosterone. So those are our estrogen options. Most of us try to avoid oral estrogen just simply because then we bypass the liver. We don't increase your clotting factors. And so that kind of minimizes some of our risk as we're older. And that is a good option if it works for you. Now, I do have like a patient today has been on it for 20 years and is not willing to give up her oral estrogen. It has been working for her. She has no other health risk. I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah. So definitely very nuanced in what works for you, right? I had a lady who ran her, ran her own business, had all the symptoms. She said, you need to make this as simple as possible for me. So she got a progesterone producing IUD and she got a vaginal estrogen ring that is systemic and she is happy as a clam. Because she doesn't have to do anything then. It's simple. You change out the vaginal ring every three months. Nice. Yeah. That's really simple. So okay. those are our estrogen options. And then we can look at our progesterone options. Now, why does progesterone matter? If you still have a uterus, you need progesterone because it protects that endometrial lining. It keeps our baseline risk of endometrial cancer nice and low. So there, when we're on estrogen plus progesterone with proper dosing, there is no increased risk of endometrial cancer. But Great. if we just... I have had patients who have come to me from different clinics, you know, getting pellets or what, not knowing what's in their dosing or coming from other providers on estrogen only yeah. and having endometrial hyperplasia. So th that can be treated with progesterone, but it's just something that, you know, if you have abnormal bleeding, it's so important to get that worked up, especially if you have postmenopausal bleeding that can never be ignored. But Progesterone placement typically is given orally at night because it helps with sleep. Yeah, it's beautiful at helping with sleep. And it just needs to be given either in a continuous fashion or a cyclic fashion. So it can be taken just 10 to 14 days out of the month for endometrial protection. Like that's the minimal that you need. But a lot of people don't want to worry with, well, am I going to have a withdrawal bleed? Did I take it these 10 days or those 10 days? You know, a lot of us are busy in life and just need that consistency of just the routine. And so they'll take it nightly. Plus it helps with sleep. And so it's a beautiful thing. Now, it also micronized progesterone. Now we do have synthetic options as well, mm -hmm. which is what was studied in the Women's Health Initiative. So I typically start with micronized progesterone and most individuals tolerate that. But the synthetics can also be used if the patient's not tolerating it for, it, it for some reason. The micronized progesterone tablet, if they're not tolerating, can also be given vaginally. So you can put it in their vagina every night. Now, some people are like, well, I'm already using my vaginal estrogen. I feel like there's a pharmacy down there. I get it. <laughs> so, there, But you can also use a progesterone producing IUD. So it's off-label use, but it works beautifully. And it, and it, so if, with somebody who really doesn't tolerate progesterone well, whether it's acne or bloating or whatever, nausea, vomiting, dragging, or whatever, then, and it's a small percentage of people, but if they do, then it, you can try giving the micronized progesterone vaginally. You can try switching to a synthetic. You can try just doing it for, cyclically for those couple of days a month to protect the lining of the uterus. And if none of those work, then a progesterone producing IUD is a brilliant option because then you're giving that progesterone just locally, don't have that large systemic absorption. And in worst case scenarios, if they tolerate nothing, a hysterectomy to remove the uterus so that you don't have to worry about the replacement of progesterone. Okay. Do you mind commenting what what's bad about pellets? Yeah. So pellets are not FDA regulated, number one. Important. It's, it's 
interesting. Most individuals don't know what's in their pellet. And so, and most of the people who are prescribing it aren't menopause certified okay. and don't have the, the true working knowledge of, of what's going on physiologically and what to do. So there is concern regarding the safety and the purity of the product gotcha. and what are you actually getting. And they're usually testosterone heavy. I have no problem replacing testosterone. Our ovaries produce testosterone and we, you know, lose that testosterone in our later years. And that imbalance in hormones is what leads to the, you know, the weight gain that we're having around our midriff. And everybody is frustrated with their new muffin top that they're carrying around. In addition to, you know, we have a, a natural reduction in our bone density and our and our muscles. So we have to compound that with eating differently and with our lifting heavy weights. You know, th those are things that are really important for lifestyle as we age. But replacing testosterone can be done safely for women, especially when in that low sexual desire. Like, so that's what the data currently tells us about replacing testosterone is that it works for postmenopausal women with low sexual desire and improving sexual desire, encounters, orgasms, et cetera which is great, but we have really poor studies in this. And so I think that our knowledge will evolve in the coming years as we put more attention towards women's health care. Anecdotally, patients tell me they think clearer, they have more energy, et cetera. Uh, but I, I think look at, that you, brain, look at that brain data, won't we eventually for testosterone? If we don't have that now because we've got some good data about estrogen and and brain fog and some of these other things in the transition. But yeah, I mean, it, it starts with us making this healthcare revolution and demanding the data, right? Dang, right, yeah. But yeah, I do, I do think we're going to see a lot of new information come forward. And so, you know, I reserve the right to change my opinion as we as we learn new information. Mm -hmm. We will tell you anecdotally, you know, that we do see those types of improvements, but it has to be done properly. And so, you know, I do, I, the problem with pellets is that we see a lot of super therapeutic levels, I meaning super high levels of testosterone. Like you do not need your husband or your brother's level of testosterone. I see women walking around in the upper hundred to 200. And we worry about, you know, hypertension, lipid disorders, basically cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Now, we all think we're going to die of breast cancer, but the number one killer of women is cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And so we, we cannot take that lightly. And so when we're replacing hormone therapy, the way the menopause certified individuals typically are doing this is with testum or a one an FDA approved male testosterone because we do not have a formulated female version in the US. They do have one in Australia, but mm -hmm. it is F so the FDA approved test in a one percent gel in a screw top tube, preferably because the gel pack, you know, they it's very difficult to travel with. You've got to try to preserve it and and put it in a Ziploc baggie. And because one male dosing is going to last a female ten days, so we dose at one tenth of the male dose. Okay, and then we repeat your testosterone levels in six to eight weeks to see where we are. Are, you know, so a lot of times what I see is that women do not have a detectable testosterone level. And so then we replace it with this gel that you apply daily, a pea size amount to the thigh daily. And we see, okay, now we can actually measure your testosterone level. So oh, we're, as long as we're in a physiologic female range, it's, I'm pretty comfortable with that, right? Right. Or if we're with, you know, close to that. Now, every lab is going to have a different level. And then I'm hoping that, again, as our studies advance, we have more information about what is truly a normal physiologic female range. But it generally, we're trying to keep you out of that high super therapeutic dosing. And I typically do a 12 week trial. If we are not feeling better yeah. on it, then, but we're in and we're absorbing it, then, you know, do we need to continue it? And you could argue for or against that. Sure. Okay. That's great. That's great. Now, let's talk about some people are not recommended to have hormone replacement therapy. The I'm going to ask you the question and, and you answer for us. People who've had uterine cancer, sometimes never. What do you say? I think it depends on the type of uterine cancer and obviously if it's been treated. You know, like I, I have had an oncologist tell me, you know, for hormone sensitive and 
endometrial cancer, that they're uncomfortable getting vaginal estrogen because of the risk of, you know, recurrence at the vaginal cusp. I would argue that, you know, most individuals, their symptoms, you know, when they have such significant vaginal dryness. Now, there are other things that we can do. We can do vaginal moisturizer. We can do hyaluronic acid. We can do an oral medication that acts selectively to the vagina. So there, there definitely are other alternatives. But I think that it's very unique to each individual, depending on the type of cancer that they've had. And it, it requires a discussion with their GYN oncologist, medical oncologist, whomever is, is managing their treatment at that point. That never a discussion, whether it's breast cancer or individual cancer, is never something that needs to be made in a silo between just you and your menopause provider. Okay, great. Because I get that question too. And I say, I think you need to talk to your doctors who've been, who treated you for that. Yeah. Uh, breast cancer, never or sometimes for hormone replacement, for estrogen replacement, hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Never say never. Okay. Never so say have, never. Have the discussion. Oh, so, yeah, Absolutely. There, so I host Sky Women's Health podcast. I had the author of Estrogen Matters on, Dr. Avram Bloomer, Blooming, sorry, Blooming. Dr. Avram Blooming is brilliant. And he wrote a book called Estrogen Matters on this very topic where he looked at all of the details, all of the research behind this. He personally had a wife and a daughter who had breast cancer, and they have not found a genetic mm-hmm. mutation there for them. And looking at all the data, they both elected to go on hormone therapy for their symptoms. Okay. And so that would be a great episode. I don't recall off the top of my head what episode number that is of Sky Women's Health Podcast, but a wonderful episode to listen to, to kind of introduce yourself to this very topic. If you are fearful of estrogen and you have a history of breast cancer, like this is somebody who's been in the trenches because he also was a medical oncologist. Nice. Thanks. Now, vaginal estrogen. Every vagina loves estrogen. Almost everybody, right? Almost everybody. Every vagina loves estrogen. Give her some estrogen. Um, (laughs) Vaginal estrogen for life. I mean, I saw a patient uh, this week who was in her 90s. And she had such significant vulvar irritation. Now, there was also some, you know, incontinence mast in there as well that we probably will not solve in her her lifetime and her age and stage of where she's at. But using a vulvar moisturizer and a vulvar balm has been extremely helpful to her to the point that using her vaginal estrogen, she wasn't up all night needing to void. And so she was feeling great and excited about that. Started using her vulvar balm. Her vulva wasn't irritated anymore. And so she forgot about that vaginal estrogen. The vaginal estrogen is the key. It is the queen. She is the player here. She is what is going to preserve the vaginal epithelium. And the vaginal wall, their vaginal cells, they start to thin. So we get a thinning of the vaginal wall, that urethra becomes more prominent. We have more urinary urgency and frequency and pain with insertion and vaginal dryness. And just even with wiping, sometimes women are like, oh, I feel like I've got fissures now. Like, what is going on here? She like, yeah, honey. give her some estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is safe for everybody. So, and also UTIs, though, right? Don't we have some data well, on that? Yes, and prevention. Of, yeah, they prevention of UTIs. A, yeah, they don't know that it's an estrogen issue. Yes, this is actually exactly what I was going to say. So my 94-year-old forgot to take her vaginal estrogen, got a UTI, landed in the hospital because it didn't respond to her oral antibiotics and had four days of IV antibiotics. So I would say, you know, vaginal estrogen saves lives. You know, right, I, right. I had a woman who was almost suicidal because she was up all night to void. She was so bothered by the urinary urgency and frequency. She had seen the urologist and all the people trying to solve her issue. I put her in vaginal estrogen and she now thinks that I have, you know, on the moon. Because <laughs> the vaginal estrogen, she now sleeps at night. She's not bothered wearing pants. Yeah. She can Amazing. Sit comfortably. What life changing, so, right? Yeah, it's really life changing. I mean, there there are a few things like I just vaginal estrogen is so key. Now, there are different formula different ways to get your vaginal estrogen. One is not better than the other. So you can get it from a vaginal estrogen cream. Some people say, oh, it's so messy. I don't like it. So I love the vaginal estrogen cream because I want it to coat all those areas because the vulva starts to thin. Sometimes the labia minora start to kind of resorb. Sometimes the clitoral hood likes to get stuck. So I want some of it to ooze out onto the the opening of the vagina into the labia minora. 
Yeah. But if people feel it's messy, they can also rub it in with their finger like a moisturizer. So that's mm-hmm. an option because some people don't use like using the applicator. But we also have a vaginal estrogen tablet. We have a suppository and we have a low dose vaginal estrogen ring that's specifically for those genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Nice. Yep. One does not work better than the other. So it's really like, what do you prefer work, works for your lifestyle? Right. So you could try one. You could change if you don't like it. Yeah. You it's can always make it. edits. Yeah. So it, for this podcast, I, w- I want point to point people to, there's another episode that's called The Hormone You Don't Know You Need, where we talk all just about vaginal estrogen. So that one's mm-hmm. helpful too. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for being here today and going through this. Is there anything else that we have forgotten to talk about that you want to add before we go? I think so. I think okay. that's a good overview. Yeah, yeah. We had a good list there that you and I put together. And and so 2024, please share this episode with your friends because they are going to want to know all these details as well. This this may sound silly. I try not to be Heather Awad, TMI person, but there have been people calling out for people to normalize this, I want to let you know that I am 56 years old. I take an estrogen patch twice a week. I take micronized progesterone every evening. And my sleep isn't quite perfect with that. So I get acupuncture once every five months mm-hmm. for that symptom as well. And just to normalize that people are actually taking these medications. So Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's 90% of my practice. And and I am perimenopausal. I hate to admit that, but I <laughs> and I started hormone therapy when I had my IUD in place because who wants periods? I'm done having babies. And I started having more period symptoms, you know, like just kind of ovarian discomfort. And then I started paying attention to it and tracking it and realized, oh, this is kind of cyclic. And and I was very short fused with everybody. And my five-year-old said I was getting meaner as I got older. (laughs) That is too good. And so mama started an estrogen patch. So I have a marine IUD and I use a patch twice weekly. And I love that formulation. I also am on testosterone though, because my testosterone levels were undetectable. Ah. And so I use a pea-sized amount of transdermal testosterone. Nice. So there you go. Everyone should know that that doctors are actually taking this stuff as well as you. So great. Well, you're in Fort Worth, Texas, and we will make sure that all your contact information is in the show notes. But please let people know where they can find you there, the name of your clinic again, and if there are places to connect with you online and and your podcast, your wonderful podcast. Thanks. Yeah. So I am at Dr. Carolyn Moyers on most platform. My practice is Sky Women's Health, and my podcast is named after my practice, Sky Women's Health, because I wanted it to be an extension of our conversations in the exam room and wanted it to be easy for everyone to find. So a Sky Women's Health podcast addresses a lot of women's health topics, really focusing on this midlife, perimenopause, menopause, sexual health, weight, all of the things that we kind of deal with in midlife. And my my physical practice, though, is in Fort Worth, Texas, and I can see anyone in the state of Texas via telehealth. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yes. Such a joy. Thank you for having me.